In this lecture, we're going to be considering the risk of material misstatement. So what we're going to be talking about are two separate things, one of which is risk. And we're going to look at risk from several different perspectives using the audit risk model. But we're also going to talk about material misstatements. So when we talk about material misstatements, what we need to understand is what is a misstatement? Well, a misstatement is an error either intentional or unintentional that exists in a transaction of a financial statement account balance. So what are we talking about here? So we're talking about errors or fraud related to the financial statements and related specifically to account balances. It's essential to understand materiality in the context of designing and conducting a quality audit Auditors are concerned about material misstatement. And again, keep in mind that when we issue an opinion, we're issuing an opinion where we're providing reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free of material misstatement. So our audit is based upon this concept of material misstatements. So let's talk about materiality. Materiality are a matter of professional judgment. It depends upon the needs of the user, the person relying on the information, whether an investor, potential investor, or other stakeholder. It also involves both quantitative and qualitative considerations. There is an official definition that we need to consider. Materiality is the magnitude of an omission or misstatement of accounting information that in view of surrounding circumstances makes it probable that the judgment of a reasonable person relying on the information would have been changed or influenced by the omission or misstatement. So we are judging this based upon the um, judgment of a reasonable person and we're considering the magnitude as it relates to the decision whether or not it would have been changed based upon the omission or misstatement. Materiality is defined by the ISA 320, materiality in planning an audit. An auditor's judgment about materiality should be based on a combination or a consideration of information needs of users as the overall group. When we consider the uh, Supreme Court. Supreme Court uh, views things based upon facts and circumstances related to a reasonable investor having significant or significantly or altered the total mix of information made available. So what we want to do is we want to understand a process for making materiality assessments. A couple of things to keep in mind that two different auditors will come up with different levels of materiality based upon their own personal judgment, based upon their own experience. So there's not a set in stone amount that would be used in terms of materiality. We certainly consider the fact that materiality is going to be based upon circumstances such as the size of the organization. But what we see here is consider a client where financial statement materiality is set at $150,000, okay? Now, what we're saying here uh, is that the auditor has set materiality at $150,000 and the materiality for accounts receivable is set at $110,000. Now, what we're looking at here is we're looking at a difference of $40,000. However, based upon a performance materiality for auditing accounts receivable, we might set this at $30,000. So we'll talk in just a minute in terms of performance materiality. But basically what we're looking at is an approach that compensates for the possibility that multiple undetected or uncorrected misstatements in accounts receivable might exist. So what is performance materiality? It's the amount or amounts set by the auditor at less than the materiality level for the financial statements as a whole or for a particular class of transactions, account balances, or disclosures. 
The term is used with respect to assessing the risk of material misstatement and determining the nature, timing, and extent of our further audit procedures. So the process for making materiality assessments. The auditor will aggregate identified misstatements so the audit team can assess the materiality of these statements. So what we're looking at is we're looking at account balances, classes of transactions, and based upon our audit testing, we're identifying specific uh, misstatements in each of these items. Keep in mind when we're talking about identifying misstatements, we're talking about doing our substantive testing where in our substantive testing we are measuring monetary misstatements. The document where misstatements are aggregated is often referred to as the Summary of Unadjusted Audit Differences, or SUAD. Clearly trivial amounts, posting materiality and so forth, inconsequential whether taken individually or in the aggregate, judged by any criteria of size, nature, and circumstances. So we're not interested in these trivial amounts, but what we're looking for is the aggregate of the uh, uh, differences between what management has put together versus what the auditor has identified in his or her testing, and these differences become a part of our misstatement. And then what we're doing is we are comparing that misstatement to our level of materiality in our determination to state whether the statement, financial statements are free of material misstatement. There are qualitative considerations related to this. The auditor considers both quantitative effects, such as the dollar amount, and qualitative effects, such as the reason when he or she is considering material misstatements. Qualitative reasons for consider, considering quantitatively small misstatements as material is potentially if there's fraud involved. Maybe we're hiding the failure to meet analysts' uh, consensus expectations. There may be a change or a loss to the income or vice versa, and management is clearly managing the earnings in such a way to come up with a specific number. Now, what we're talking about here, uh, we're talking about things that are less than material, but certainly would be of interest to us as we're considering the audit. If it affects the compliance with loan covenants and effectively increases management's compensation. So again, what we're looking at here is we're looking at misstatements that are below a material level, but essentially indicates that management may in fact be manipulating or using another term, managing the earnings or managing the financial statement. When we consider these, uh, we, we consider these things, we certainly would absolutely not disregard these because we're not going to say, oh, well, they're underneath our, our material misstatements, so these are, these are irrelevant. But what we're talking about here is considering these qualitative elements as we're considering material mistakes. So let's consider this from the perspective of the audit risk model. We've talked about the audit risk model in the past. Audit risk is the risk that the auditor takes that he or she is issuing an unqualified opinion when in fact there are material misstatements. We're never going to eliminate this risk, but the goal is always that we reduce the audit risk to a reasonable level. Well, we do this by considering risk in three specific areas, the inherent risk, the control risk, and the detection risk. The inherent risk and the control risk is what we're doing as part of the planning of the audit is where we determine the risk of material misstatement. Hence, the discussion related to materiality is very important as we're considering these two elements. The final piece of this is the detection risk. The detection risk is the risk that the auditor will not detect a material misstatement. The auditor 
is responsible for the detection risk by developing the nature, timing, and extent of these audit procedures that are used to measure monetary misstatement. And the key point that we want to take away here is that when we are measuring material misstatements, we're doing this with our substantive testing that is a part of the detection risk process. The other testing that we're doing in terms of testing for the inherent risk as well as the control risk is where we are measuring the risk of material misstatement, but we're not doing the testing in terms of materiality. The testing for materiality is our substantive testing, and again, the nature, timing, and extent of our substantive test is based upon our determination of the risk of material misstatement. So let's talk about a couple of definitions. The definition for the inherent risk is the susceptibility of an assertion about a class of transactions, account balances, or disclosures to a misstatement that could be material either individually or when aggregated with other misstatements before consideration of any related controls. So a couple of key things here is we are considering inherent risk before considering the related control activities of management. But let's focus on the word inherent. Inherent is basically the state of being that we have in relationship to these transactions, accounts, asset groups, uh, whatever it is. And as we're looking at these elements, we consider the inherent risk. So the idea is what is it about this thing this transaction, this account, this uh, group of, of, of assets that creates risk. So as an example, if we're dealing with cash, cash is inherently risky. That is the nature of cash, it's inherently risky. If we're dealing with asset groups inventory that is very small, very expensive, and easily transferable, there is an inherent risk specifically related to the fact that these items might be stolen. So again, we're considering the inherent risk without regard or before any consideration of any related controls. Control risk. Control risk is the risk that a misstatement could occur in an assertion about a class of transaction, account balance, or disclosure that could be material either individually or when aggregated with other misstatements. This will not prevent or detect and correct, that will not be prevented, detected, or corrected on a timely basis by the entity's internal controls. So we're basically saying here is the control risk is the inverse of the quality of the internal control structure within the organization. So as we are assessing the control risk. We identify where the risks are. We're identifying those risks based upon our inherent risk. We then determine whether or not management has implemented appropriate controls in relationship to the risk. So we always think of the relationship between risk and controls. So what is the potential bad thing that could happen? And the control risk is again, is reduced if in fact the controls are in place. So in the control risk, we're asking the question, what is management doing to mitigate these bad things from happening? So based upon the inherent risk and the control risk, the combination of the two defines our risk of material misstatement. Once we've identified the risk of material misstatement is we determine the nature, timing, and extent of our substantive procedures. So back to the audit risk. This audit risk model is a way that the auditor is actually able to manage the various risks in such a way that he or she is able to minimize the risk that the financial statements are issued and the auditor is saying that there are no material misstatements when in fact there is a material misstatement.
the risk of material misstatement determines the detection risk. The risk that the procedures performed by the auditor, so you notice the key word is this is something that's done by the auditor to reduce the audit risk to an acceptably low level, uh, will not detect a material misstatement that exists that could be material either individually or aggregated with other misstatements. So the auditor manages detection risk based upon this concept of determining the nature, timing, and extent of the substantive procedures. And again, the substantive procedures are the procedures that we use to manage the or to measure the material misstatements in the financial statements. And we do this through the nature, timing, and extent. And as an example, if we increase the extent or the amount of testing, we are actually reducing the detection risk. So there's an inverse relationship between detection risk and the amount and the quality and timing of these audit procedures. Okay, so this is in a very short video, we've identified materiality, we've identified this risk model, the audit risk model that, I, uh, that uh, determines the risk of material misstatement. And based upon that risk of material misstatement, we determine the nature, timing, and extent of our audit procedures. And these are the audit procedures that we're using to measure monetary misstatement. In our next video, we'll talk specifically about what some of these tests are that we're going to do in each of these areas. So I thank you very much for your time, and I'm looking forward to continuing this discussion.